everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Some horse owners in Oklahoma are concerned about the possibility of blister beetles this time of year. We'll have more on that in just a moment, but first an update on this year's cotton crop. Here's SUNUP's Curtis Hare and our Extension Cotton Specialist, Dr. Seth Bird. Talking cotton now with our Cotton Extension Specialist, Seth Bird. And Seth, it's been a pretty weird summer as we've been discussing a lot here on SUNUP. So how has that weird summer been impacting cotton? I mean, it's been fairly beneficial, to be honest. Um, you know, we've had some cooler weather to start and I know we talked earlier in the summer and we were worried about being behind. And we're still behind. You know, cotton never really catches up. It can, it can make some visual uh, compensation, but it's still a little behind where we'd like to see it at this point. Um, but coming out of July, we had a really warm end of the month. Um, across the state, you know, the crop's generally in, in probably early to mid bloom right now. Uh, and we've had, in a lot of places, not everywhere, but in a lot of places, we've had enough moisture to really drive this crop uh, a lot of uh, the way on just rainfall. So that's been pretty beneficial for us. We'd like to see it continue the warm spell and, and get some more rain through August to help us out. Yeah, I, it, the last time we spoke, you said that there, one thing that you were dealing with also was some insect pressure. So how does that looking? We've had more uh, flare ups of different insect pests this year than I think I've seen in my short time in Oklahoma. Uh, so there's been flare ups of a variety of things. Um, early season, we were dealing with thrips and we even had a lot of wireworm uh, incidents across Oklahoma. Um, and then as we moved into the squaring stage, we started seeing both flea hoppers and plant bugs. Um, but we, we've kind of survived a lot of it. I know there were a lot of sprays made. I know folks were diligent in scouting and, and making proper timely applications to help us protect the crop. And anytime you've got a, a crop that's immature or behind on the calendar, retaining fruit and protecting fruit is the only way to really mitigate that, uh, that lost time we had early. And so I think we've done a good job of that. And so now we're in full bloom in most of the crop, or at least early bloom. And so now we're worried about stink bugs. There's usually stink bug, stink bug pressure somewhere in the state every year. So scouting for that and making, making timely applications is gonna be just as important to protect the fruit. So, you know, going forward, you know, it's August now, September is gonna be here before we know it. Um, and, you know, we're gonna be creeping along to harvest. What's some things that really just need to happen with with the cotton crop going forward? We need a very, very long August and September. Uh, we need, we, we really need a lot of uh, favorable weather. Uh, you know, we'd love to see rainfall just to help us out, especially with the dry land crop. Um, if that rain could fall overnight and not have uh, interrupt our sunlight and our, and our warm weather, that'd be great. Uh, but yeah, we just really need to, to, to sort of make up some ground on what we experienced early in the season. And if we've got good fruit retention, and if we've been able to protect against, you know, losses due to pest, uh, you know, a warm August, a warm September can really help drive that fiber development. And as long as we got good fruit retention, we can hopefully still have a, a crop that turns out mature, um, you know, by the end of the day. Now, about the last year when we had that cool snap in September or two years ago where we had that, you know, kind of early October freeze, uh, something like that this year, uh, could be pretty detrimental just because we've been behind and we still are behind at this point. You know, I was going to bring that up. Are there things that producers can kind of keep in like, can, you know, you, you can't predict the weather, yeah. but just kind of uh, prepare for something like that um, in regards to just managing the crop, maybe defoliation or, or, or stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I think you got to manage for, for pulling that trigger early all year long. And that's why we really talk about, you know, we don't like to compared to other areas of the cotton belt, we don't like to see in short season environments big applications of fertility go out. But yeah, I mean, we've done some work with, with harvest aid application timing. Uh, there are some uh, opportunities if we, if we get into a situation where we might need to make an early application that we don't see a, a huge detriment to that. But again, it's also being able to predict that. We don't always see them coming. Sometimes they, they show up out of nowhere and, and then that's something that's really hard to deal with. All right, well, thanks, Seth. Seth Bird, Cotton Extension Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Hi, Wesley here with the weekly Mesonet Weather Report. 
The weather this past week was quite enjoyable from a temperature standpoint. However, it was another week with limited rainfall for most sites. After being well watered for most of the summer, our crops are starting to show signs of moisture stress in many locations. The seven-day rainfall map from midweek shows close to two inches in Texas County and an inch or more in several north-central counties, including 2.3 inches in Blackwell. But the majority of the state came in with less than a tenth of an inch. This has soil moisture levels drying out in most areas as seen by the negative brown numbers on this weekly change in the 10-inch fractional water index map. This soil moisture map from Wednesday shows greens are dwindling week by week. There are now more brown numbers representing the dry end of the scale than the green numbers indicating the wet end of the scale. Exactly one year ago, the soil moisture was in better shape with over half of the map registering a green .9 or higher. Rain chances continue to look slim next week as seen on the forecast map with chances being below normal for this time of year. Gary is up next with the newest drought map for the state. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well up until now most of the summer we've had good drought news. Uh, improvement after improvement, not much intensification. Unfortunately things may be changing. Let's take a look and see where we're at. In the same general pattern, we do have a little bit more uh, moderate drought now introduced up into uh, northwest Oklahoma, northeastern Harper, northwestern Woods County. So a little bit of intensification up there. But then we have another spot starting to grow down in far southeast Oklahoma. It is right now, it's actually just abnormally dry conditions, but it is a sign that if we don't get some good rains, we will see uh, drought start to appear down in that part of the state as well. We can take a look at the 30 day rainfall and see exactly what's going on. We do see these areas of blue on the map uh, for the Mesnet rainfall. Uh, those are areas that didn't get much rainfall, basically less than an inch. So that part up there in northwestern Oklahoma, that shows up pretty well. But we also see some blue starting to show up in central, uh, east central, and also that part down there in southeastern and south central Oklahoma. Becomes much more clear when we take a look at the percent of normal rainfall map for the last 30 days. Those reds and oranges, those are below normal uh, below normal rainfall amounts and we do see those areas in trouble at least in the last 30 days and that part down there in the east central Oklahoma just to the east of the Oklahoma City metro area is also fairly dry so another another area to take a take another look at next week but to see where we're in real trouble uh, at least at the current time we take a look at the 60-day rainfall map for the Mesnet uh, again, the parts up there in northwest Oklahoma, Buffalo's only received 2.4 inches of rain over the last 60 days. And again, those uh, greens and those yellow colors are low rainfall amounts. We see that across southeastern Oklahoma as well. So some of these deficits have been going on for 60 days. We've been able to hold off the drought because it hasn't been very hot, but now we're back to a hot, drier pattern, so we're going to have to keep an eye on it. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. We're joined now by Dr. Chris Heine, our Extension Equine Specialist. Chris, we want to talk a little bit about blister beetles, uh, a, a good topic to cover this time of year and just kind of remind people to be aware and, and some of the things they need to look out for, right? Yeah, so um, sometimes in the fall you can actually have swarms of blister beetles that may actually uh, invade your property and they may even like come into your barn looking to get out of the heat and the sun. Um, so certainly if you see a lot of insect activity in beetles, particularly striped uh, blister beetles, you want to make sure you address that right away. There are pesticides um, that you can apply, essentially premise sprays uh, that can go onto the surfaces of the building. Those don't go on the animals, of course. Um, we use different products uh, for pest control on an animal versus off. Uh, but if there's dead beetles anywhere after that, you got to make sure you get rid of all of those because even a few of them, if the horse accidentally ingests some, 
um, can be lethal. And then the more common way they usually get them is actually through hay. So I always think of alfalfa hay as being the biggest risk factor for blister beetle ingestion in a horse. So what do people need to be aware of in terms of purchasing hay? I mean, what's kind of the guidance you have there? So yeah, horse owners that want to feed alfalfa, and it is high protein, so there's a reason that we feed it. It's pretty high energy, so it's a good hay for horses. Uh, but if it is grown in areas where there are blister beetles, you have to be extremely cautious um, and work with somebody that is very knowledgeable about blister beetles. Or alternatively, there's a lot of bagged feed, so cubed or pelleted alfalfa or work with a hay dealer that actually imports their alfalfa from states where blister beetles aren't a problem. Is there any risk for humans? Um, not really. I think it's more of a, a nuisance, really. So certainly if you've got a big blister beetle problem, they happen to like get on you or they're under your shirt and you whack them, um, they can actually cause a blistering effect on the skin. So that toxin, the cantharidin that blister beetles have, there's a reason they're called blister beetles. It's really, really irritating to the skin and mucous membranes. Are there years, I guess, when the blister beetles are worse than others? Yeah, so particularly this year when I talk to my friends that are up north, um, because they've had a lot of hot and dry, their grasshopper population is really, really surged. Um, and so these blister beetles, the young of them actually eat the eggs of grasshoppers. So essentially, you know, it's a multi-factor thing. So if we have a higher population of the grasshoppers as well, then that's gonna drive up your blister beetle problems and they may occur in places in the country where it's not normally a problem. Obviously, this can be a hot topic you have some fact sheets for those who want to learn more. Yeah, absolutely. We have several of them that are available through Oklahoma State. Okay, terrific. We'll check those out. Chris, thanks a lot. And for a link to the fact sheets we talked about, go to sunup.okstate.edu. Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow Calf Corner on Sun Up. We're, we're going to address some things that are available to us now in terms of DNA testing and some technologies and making selection decisions that we're going to base keeping replacement heifers or bull development on or just what we're going to develop to market at some point down the road. It's a benefit to us to capitalize on some of these technologies and know a little more about the genetic potential of some of these animals. What are the three things we can basically learn from DNA typing or submitting DNA? We can verify parentage. We can take a look at uh, simply inherited traits that are controlled by one pair of genes at one locus. Think of things like the horn pole condition in cattle, coat color inheritance, and even some of the genetic defects that we've identified over the years. The third thing we can learn from DNA testing is just getting EPDs or expected progeny differences in the form of genomically enhanced EPDs where we're taking a look at that DNA, we're identifying some genes that have got impact on the variation we see in our performance traits, be it birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, milk production, marbling. These are traits that we think of as being quantitative and polygenic there's lots of genes that have an impact on those, and those genes we can identify that maybe have got a plus effect or a negative effect, we're gonna identify those and, and we're gonna see an EPD come back in the form of a genomically enhanced EPD. It's gonna have a higher accuracy, and based on the genes we find, that EPD itself is gonna potentially go up or down. First step is to contact our respective breed association and order those tests. Uh, we're gonna have instructions involved on how to submit that DNA sample. That can be in the form of hair, like hair follicles coming out of a tail switch. Typically, if we're thinking about young calves, we need them to be older than weaning age before we submit DNA that way. Probably the most convenient ways to do it on young calves are tissue samples, like a snip from the ear, or just a blood sample on a DNA card or a blood tube. If we have got 
an older sire that we have potentially collected and got semen and storage on, we can submit semen if we want to DNA type an older bull. But those will be the forms that it takes. Again, contacting a breed association and figuring out the proper method to get those tissue samples submitted to the lab. We're looking at a few weeks turnaround time, maybe two, three months tops from the time we'd order test, submit the DNA, and actually obtain those results from the lab. Again, we're gonna verify parentage. We're gonna identify genotypes at Locus where we have, uh, we have known genetic defects or horn pole status or coat color. And we're gonna end up getting genomically enhanced EPDs that are more accurate. And because they're more accurate, they're gonna improve our accuracy of selection and potentially accelerate our progress in meeting our breeding objectives. Again, these are all tools that are available to us right now as we think about maybe that second round of vaccinations on spring-born calves and having them through the chute at some point here before weaning or at weaning. All this is information that we can have in our toolbox to base selection decisions on, on these cattle at a very young age that when we're talking about registered pedigreed animals that we've got a breed association to work with. Thanks for joining us this week. We'll see you next week on Cow-Calf Corner. Out here talking crop prices again with Kim Anderson. Now, Kim, what's going on with the wheat markets? Well, where do you want me to start? Well, how about we start at the beginning? Well, if you start at, uh, say, mid-June at the harvest, our wheat prices were around $6.30. Uh, you know, we was expecting world uh, wheat production to be 29.1 billion bushels, a record crop. By mid-June, uh, that price is down to $5.80, down 50 cents. Walled it around for a couple weeks, 5.80 to six bucks, and then by early July, it was down to 560. Then in a few days, six or seven days, is back up to 640. In six days, it was down to 615. And now we're up to about 680. From the bottom to the top over this last uh, month and a half, we've had a dollar and 80 cent price move. The average price has been $6.07. The bottom was 560 and the top's current price about 580. What caused the $1.80 jump in the market? Well, you go back into June, I think the big, what happened there was that the spring wheat crop in the northern U.S. and Canada, uh, bad weather, the crop conditions continued to deteriorate, production expectations went down, and I, that had a positive impact on the price. Plus, in the corn production, I think they were lower in corn production expectations. Recently, uh, Russia, their production expectations or predictions were up around 3.1 billion bushels. They've been lower than them over the last few weeks. One analyst that I, I think does a good job has it down to 2.75 billion bushels. So that Russian crop keeps going down. This week we've had lower expectations or predictions in Germany and, and in France. So I think that world wheat production is probably going to be down around 2.8 uh, uh, 9 billion bushels or 28.9 billion bushels rather than the, the expected 29.1 a month ago. So how should producers sell their wheat? Well, if they've already sold it, they're done. If they haven't sold it, I'd probably take some advantage. However, if Russian uh, wheat production is down around that 2.75 billion bushels, we're probably going to have higher wheat prices. But given the volatility in this market, I don't think you can do a one and done. I think you've got to stagger it. If you're going to sell in a month's time period, sell a, a fourth of it each week. If you're going to sell over several months, stagger it out because with this type of volatility where you're having 35 cent up or 35 cent down price moves, you can't hit the top or the bottom of the market. And what about corn and soybean prices? Well, you look at uh, corn prices, forward contract, they've been relatively flat, flat the next last few weeks, around $5.35 for a forward contract. You look at uh, soybeans, uh, they've been down about 60 cents over the last few weeks, a forward contract, 12.55 on that. And if you look at cotton, since April, they went from 76 cents to 90 cents. And over the last few weeks, they've increased a, a penny or two. All right, thank you very much, Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University.
Talking 4-H now and the summer tradition that reached a centennial milestone. You know, last year we did a, a virtual 4-H roundup and it was a great experience. But, but nothing like seeing each other face to face. You know, it's this pinnacle year, the Centennial Roundup. We tried to make sure that everything was in place and we had a lot of barriers to go through. This year we actually offered three options. We had uh, groups could come in and stay the night for two nights if they wanted to and, and have kind of a more complete Roundup experience. Groups could participate entirely virtually or groups could come in for just the day program and uh, we had counties take take advantage of all those opportunities. It's been so great to see how Oklahomans have overcome the obstacles that it has presented and how we've adapted to going to virtual workshops and conferences and just how great of a transition we made. Instead of seeing it as a stop sign, we overcame it and kept on going and we do what the 4-H motto is and to make the best better. Coming back two years later, just seeing this place and being able to go up on stage and speak to my people, it was, it was insane. I couldn't fathom how much I truly miss it and the passion and love for 4-H is there with each one of us. This is my fifth year in 4-H and this is my first time going to Roundup. So I'm very excited that I get to be a part of the 100th Roundup. My dad went to Roundup and he was so excited that I got to go to Roundup and I think it just, he got all the memories and he was thinking about what happened to him when he went to Roundup. And my great grandmother attending uh, some of the early Roundups over 70 years ago, it's exciting just to see the progress of her talking about staying in older dorms or pitching tents and just how it has grown and changed over the years. And it excites me to see what Oklahoma 4-H will do in the future. And I have waited my whole 4-H lifetime to come here and I've been so excited because they all come back with stories and fun times and I just was looking forward to do what the older kids were doing and now I'm here. You know and we allowed a lot of time uh, during this experience just to allow kids that opportunity to socialize and reconnect with their friends and, and from other counties and it's I, I think everybody's just really left happy with the idea of just having had time to connect with other 4-H members and see what's going on around the state. One of the 4-H'ers who attended Roundup is now back home and using her skills as a gardener to help those in need in her community. Sign-up's Curtis Hare takes us to Canadian County to learn more. When it comes to tending the garden in these hot, humid days, the earlier the better. 4-H'er Kylie Dietrich wants to beat the heat for sure, but more importantly, she wants to get to the produce before the cottontail does. And then we grow zucchini and green beans and okra and uh, watermelon and pumpkins and tomatoes and um, cucumbers and bell peppers and cayenne peppers and jalapenos. With the February winter storm and the general shakeup of the pandemic, Kylie's garden is a little behind this year. But when you've been gardening as long as she has, you learn to tread the rough waters to make a crop. When I was born, my parents started a garden and then as I grew up, I started kind of like helping in the garden and... Well, like she said, it started off when she was young. But from that point on, Kylie's been interested in being out. When we're out here grow up planting and picking up and setting up and uh, getting the garden all in order, she's out here with us. And when I see that they're starting to like produce, we get excited. So we like, because like we um, can eat like fresh produce and not have to buy it from the store. But all these good looking fruits and veggies ain't just for the Dietrichs to enjoy. As part of her 4-H project, Kylie donates a lot of what she grows to the less fortunate in her community. And today she's taking a load out to the Mana Pantry in Yukon. It's um, a place where you can donate things and people that like don't have like as much money and need something to eat, they can go there and get what they need and have a meal. You know, when she's handing out those vegetables and the squash and the cucumbers and things of that nature, she lights up just as much as the people she's giving it to lights up. And so it helps both her and them. Um, it makes me feel um, excited that I get to like help someone out and, and make their um, day feel better. Sherry Rogers is the director of the Mana Pantry, and her ministry serves about 250 families a month. She says Kylie's donations are a huge help to the community. A lot of our clients are older and they love homegrown vegetables. 
They get so excited when they see homegrown vegetables. It, it just really impresses us, and it means a lot. It means a lot to me that some parents are doing the, a good job, uh, but it means a lot to our clients that they see a younger generation stepping up and, and helping out. For Chad, watching Kylie dedicate herself to better her community makes him feel the way that, well, the way any parent feels when their child is doing his or her best. Proud. 4-H has been an awesome opportunity for Kylie and she really lights up. It helps her um, with her self-esteem uh, and just like we said earlier, just being able to give back and uh, being a part of her community. In Canadian County, I'm Curtis Hare. Thanks so much for joining us for SUNUP this week. A reminder, you can see us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at SUNUP.